Oh, now that, now that's interesting. <laughs> just pick. <laughs> just keep recording. Keep recording. <laughs> Congratulations, we made it into the shower. Uh, the sauna, sorry. <laughs> Oh, mate, he's actually dropping one. The spiritual world, the snowy mountains are nice. It's a tech talk home that's nothing like my house, but it's still fantastic to see. Being able to <laughs> point your finger at someone, being able to clap, it's a really social engagement. I'm looking forward to having this conversation about you, your career, and also this technology that you've enabled me to utilize for this session. Thanks for spending the time with me today. It's, it's great to have this, this virtual world come into to see what you've been up to, but then also to provide the audience with a bit of a, a view into, into into Bradley's world, right? What you've been up to and what you're now doing as, as part of your role. Um, yeah, so definitely. Just introduce yourself and let everyone know who you are and what you do. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, my name is Bradley Wilkie. Um, I've spent 17 years in the IT channel as um, at the last position I was in, the director of procurement for CDW. And uh, over the last year, I've set up uh, well, two businesses, really. One's a business consultancy for procurement, mentoring um, different businesses to help them make themselves more efficient, more scalable, more profitable. And uh, the business I've spent a lot of time in is Fuzzy Brick, which is our VR business. And uh, yeah, I'll tell you a bit more about that. But um, that's kind of where we've been invested a lot of time as the technology evolves and we're in a situation which we think plays, uh, plays well to the solutions we've got. Perfect. So let's, let's have a bit of a background, right? So what, how did your career start and what have you been up to over the years to, to today? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, 17 years um, in the IT industry. While I was doing my A-levels, I was building engines or at least helping and learned a lot about, um, you know, engine building and uh, fueled my passion really for cars. Um, I was doing A-levels. I was helping in this it, it, on the side really as a bit of a part-time job. And uh, it's a bit sad, really. But my mum had said to me, you know, you can't, can't keep doing this. You wanted to get into IT, go and get an IT job. So that meant I walked around the streets for many days and weeks looking for jobs at the lowest pay I could. Eventually stumbling across something in a window at Reed in Ilford that said it was an IT buyer role and uh, decided, well, it's got the word IT in it. I'm not sure what a buyer is and landed myself at CDW. Met with Phil, who was the owner and grew in a career in procurement as a buyer over the years, which eventually led on to me managing the team and then um, becoming eventually a director. Obviously, as the business got bought by CDW, um, I managed a, quite a large team and uh, across a number of different commercial areas. So uh, yeah, my career in that business, uh, basically for 17 years, effectively with one company. Fantastic. And what would you say were the most memorable moments of that? I think um, like back in the day, it was such an amazing family business. It all felt like, you know, I think there was about 35 odd people when I perhaps joined. Um, that family energy and drive and oneness was great. And obviously I joined at a time when we were doing about 12 million pounds a year revenue. And business grew rapidly and we very quickly went into a series of acquisitions where um i had been heavily involved in helping those businesses merge align into some of the processes and uh, benefits and scalable benefits of joining this the bigger organization um and those are the things that you remember you know traveling the country going to different countries with an amazing team of people and uh, delivering change and letting every day be different was, was, you know, incredibly memorable for me. Yeah, and let's pick up like, some maybe the some of the mistakes that we found along the right way, right? So, um, what was the biggest mistake that you found and the lesson you learned from it? Yeah, good question. Yeah, for me, like, unless you're not, if if you're not making mistakes, then you're not learning. Just try not to make the same mistake uh, multiple times. Um, <clears throat> I think for me, I'd always felt like I could do the job really well. And so whilst I was managing a team, 
I was very protective of making sure we always were, you know, try to be 100% all the time. Um, I think looking back now, I realized the power in developing people and, you know, the benefit of, of growing a team of people that are successful, that are willing to make mistakes and willing to learn and push the boundaries. I think I spent a bit too long, you know, trying to do things myself rather than trust the team and grow a team, which I think in the sort of end of my career or for a number of years before I left CDW, um, I think I felt like I, at least I could say I loved doing that and felt like I had good success doing that. Do you feel like you've made any sacrifices along the way? I think, I think you do. And I think you have to, um, I don't necessarily think they're bad. I think some sacrifices can be good. I think as long as you're not continually sacrificing yourself, then, um, then you have to. Um, and I think it's good for you. Um, so for me, you know, the long hours, the traveling, the, the, the weeks away from home, perhaps at times, or at least days away, the way in which you see change through the, what you're doing, I think makes it worthwhile. As long as you can always get that time back and have the flexibility to spend time with your family. And I definitely feel like I had that. So, yeah, sacrifices of time and traveling, but um, joining that with fun and enjoyment. Yeah. And all right, so if you're looking back at yourself when you first started out, um, what three tips would you have given yourself if, to, to help you on that journey? Yeah, good question. Um, I definitely think that thing about me feeling like I needed to be the best at the actual job. And it did take a person, one person in particular, I'll probably say, his, I'll say his name, Chris Rickman, we may even tag him in here. But Chris was brought into the business and really helped challenge me on who I was and what I wanted to do. And yeah, I think, for me, it was that moment of realizing that fun wasn't just about trying to be the best buyer in the industry, but it was about um, growing other people, developing other people and watching them grow, and building a really strong team. That for me would be the thing I'd go back and say, look, it's great that you want to be the best, but what's next and how are you being a leader? Um, and I felt like I had those leadership skills, really didn't tap into them until pro probably five or six years after I joined the business. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I think that's where having a, a mentor and a coach to a degree to help you find find it what you want, what you, what you thought you knew, but just to double check it, right? And to make sure that you are on the journey that you wanted to be on and to challenge you. Right? It's very easy for people to sit and become complacent in their in their roles and yep. not really progress. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's kind of uh far too prevalent to see people that aren't really happy with what they're doing and stay at the job just because, you know, it's bringing in money. Yeah. And, and another question, right? So was there any point in your career where you were kind of sort of thinking, this is, this is I'm done, I'm quitting. This is not what I want. And then how did, how did you overcome it? Because it's very often that we hear about um, fatigue, right? And with those negative thoughts that come into our minds when we're extremely under stress, duress or pressure. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people that, that don't necessarily push through that boundary and, and challenge themselves a bit more and, and get it under control and work through it. And would rather jump ship, as an example, and, and, and start again and build their own brand again, ultimately. So, yeah. Do you ever have that at all? Um, I'd probably say never to the point where I thought I'm just done with this. Uh, I mean, I might have said that a couple of times. Actually, I was very, very passionate about change. We were in a business that was continually growing. So, and it wasn't like, I didn't feel like that for long periods of time. Um, so I think being brought up with a family that was relentless at achieving something they wanted to achieve and never gave up probably helps quite a lot. And so, yeah, I think that brought me quite a long way. Um, yeah, I, I just don't think sort of quitting is in my nature. I think like later on in my career, um, whilst I did continue to progress, for me, I needed more of a challenge, which is obviously what caused me to leave CDW and then set, set up my own company. Um, and I've absolutely loved it. Like for me, that was the challenge that I probably couldn't have got CDW. Um, creating something that was quite niche, still is quite niche, in an emerging market. And um, 
in you know having the challenge of actually having to sell and market your product but it's so much fun and so challenging for me it was absolutely the right decision so yeah i think there's times when it depends who you are what's your makeup and um i think a lot of that comes from family um I, I've never really felt like that until the end where I felt like I just needed that challenge and that I needed to go and do my own thing and test myself. Um, and it's definitely been a test. Kind of, kind of like a, an off-the-cuff question, but what does a, what does a day in the life of Bradley look like now? What, what's your day, what's your day made up of from a, a work perspective? Yeah, sure. So there's obviously two businesses that I'm involved in. So Fuzzy Brick is the VR business. Recore is a business that I've just launched recently, which helps me and enables me, I guess, to help other businesses become more scalable, more efficient, uh, and buy better. And so um, I do both of those businesses. I spend more time at the moment in Fuzzy Brick just because we've seen a huge ramp up in businesses that perhaps are getting Zoom fatigue or video conference fatigue. They want something more. They know they're not going to meet each other face to face. And uh, this type of platform is of real interest to them. So um, we're definitely very busy doing that. Normally, uh, at the moment, so I'm definitely waking up a bit later. I'll take the kids in. I spend a lot more time with the kids and take them into school most days. Um, and then get to the office, maybe nine, quarter past nine, um, with my business partner, um, who's our cameraman today. And um, yeah, we spend a lot, <laughs> we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, doing so many different things in the business. So um, we typically have a good plan for the day, but you can imagine everything from finance, accounting and new product development, customer proposals, video creation, content creation. Um, There's just so many things to do. Um, That's the thing that I think baffles you most when you start your own business. If you're trying to do 12 different things, then uh, it's just making sure you've got good time management and you're making good use of your time to create all the things, do the things you need to do. Yeah, perfect. Thought should we move to a different area of the house? Yeah, go for it. Um, should we go not in the sauna? <laughs> Unless you want to record that laughing joke again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can. Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, I'm going to sit over here. Oh, are we? Are we? Are we in the sauna? Are you going to the sauna now? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, Mark, sit over here. And I'm going to find my chair. Yeah. So, so, so what, what made you get into the VR business? Why, why do this and why now? Yeah, good question. So I bought some VR kit. I was toying with the idea for quite some time and I love racing and I've seen a lot of VR simulations and thought, just got to have it. So um, I bought it and realized after a few months, that actually, this would be a great idea to bring racing simulators and VR team building and bring that into an office so it's all mobile rather than have a, you know, a VR arcade and uh, set this up for businesses and in particular in our industry i really felt like there were too many donut days going on and not enough tech being used so um kind of validated that there was a bit of a business model at you know um, early stages and then made the decision that actually this would work after speaking to a number of people brought mark on board um who um, who owns part owns the company and uh yeah that was the reason why we started to do it we felt the tech industry needed it we saw there was an opportunity. We knew it was niche, so slightly dangerous. It wasn't like there was loads of people doing this. But um, we thought, yeah, this is a technology that's emerging. We want to do some fun stuff with it. We want to do some team building with it. But we also know there's a future in training, in meetings, events, but that's going to be years away. Obviously, little did we know that COVID would accelerate that forwards for us and perhaps make us an even more profitable business. Yeah, definitely. And I can, I, I can see use cases, please, I mean, even in... I'd usually attend two, three, four, five conferences a year, the likes of VMworld, Microsoft United, Citrix Synergy, and travel all the way around the world to ultimately attend three, four, maybe five sessions I wanted to attend. And then yeah. the rest of the time would be networking with peers and very people in the industry that I haven't met for 12 months. And I can see in this situation where now those organizations have come out and said, we're not going to hold a physical conference now until 2022. This could be a really powerful way of engaging. So if you're paying your Two thousand dollars to sign up to a conference or more, even in certain circumstances, six thousand dollars to sign up to a conference. There's no reason why you couldn't bundle in a VR headset, not necessarily a Quest Oculus Quest device. It could be the the Pico ones or whatever it might be, yep. and allow people to interact at a social level like this. So walk around a 
a, a conference center, walk around into sessions they want to go and attend. And for me, the beauty of that is that I can actually attend sessions that I wouldn't have been able to attend when I was there physically because I couldn't get across the building fast enough or the room is full, right? So there'd be a room yeah. that can see 50 people. So how do I then watch that session back? I have to wait until it's released on demand and all those kind of things. I can really see a use case for, for this kind of setup to allow yeah. that social engagement in an era where we're not going to be able to, to socially interact as we used to. Yeah, definitely. And as, as you say, like, it's, this is so much more than just seeing someone's face on a video, and there's absolutely a place for that. Um, but to feel like, you know, I can see your face, we can see each other move, we can do virtual high fives, all that sort of weird stuff. Um, it's, it's really great and feels so much more real than just that video call. Um, obviously, there's features that we haven't shown um, yet, you know, to, to turn on 3D sound and have distance-based sound. So we can work in a group over here, and this group over here won't hear us. That's really powerful. And obviously, there's loads of different applications in training, in um, customer communication, education events, in um, you know, speech training and putting people into situations that you just wouldn't be able to do in the real world. VR becomes really compelling. But exactly as you say, you know, not having to travel, being carbon neutral and being able to go to so many more events and make yourself m so much more accessible. We're speaking to CEOs that they love speaking to people in their business. They've got a global organization and they don't do it as much as they want. People don't feel like they get as much time with them. And this platform allows them to come and meet in more cozy spaces like this and actually really get to know people much quicker and from a CEO's perspective, much more frequently than they do in the real world. So there's loads of use cases for this. And this particular platform at the moment will have, you could have 50 people in this room, for instance, there are other platforms we're working on, and, and this particular platform, Engage, is an amazing platform. They've got a really, really exciting roadmap. But, you know, there's other people we speak to that have got exhibition halls that will take up to 1,000 people in VR. Um, and it's hugely powerful when you think about exhibitions of the future, um, which are pretty much almost ready now, um, and for vendors, you know, to be investing in and designing in their own exhibition stands with a click of the button by looking at presets and choosing the design they like, us adding in some animations and some objects and things that you want to see there, and, and being able to create and, and buy a premium primer state in those exhibition halls. With their salespeople just putting on a headset, dropping into the exhibition hall and jumping in a stand straight from their home. So that's you know the amazing design and access possibilities are simple. I'm sure you found it pretty simple just to open the delivery that we sent you, turn it on with a few clicks, very simple you're into the platform and i don't know i assume you found it easy you're in here now yeah yeah so for me it was it was really easy. It was pretty much plug and play i think the bit for me that, that i didn't read the uh the note on to be fair so it's my own fault not the platform's fault is not smiling on the photo you upload to create your own avatar right because then it, it's a random smirk <laughs> on the avatar so <laughs> having your picture with, with with no no facial expression ultimately then uploading it once i did that it was perfectly fine and easy getting into this environment, coming into this room, finding the room. And even, even last night when I was trialing this, just having a play around with the Engage platform, I even went and joined a, a Japanese kanji lesson, right? So how to write in Japanese language. And I found that really interesting to be able to sit there and practice doing uh, the signs and all the various things that they're doing on that the, the teacher was telling you to do. And you had people in the room with you that you could interact with as well to an extent. And it was, for me, it was just another level of learning and engagement that I hadn't yeah, seen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Last night the training's around. really powerful in it because we can record, you know, what we're doing now and we could replay that at a later date. So if we were carrying an activity here, working as a team, you know, with people all across the world, but we're all in one virtual space. With businesses, we don't need 100 trainers, you know, one in every country. Um, we can just have the very best trainers meet with um employees in you know any environment that we can want to create but we can record it and play that back afterwards so even if you're doing i don't know health and safety course or a technical training session you could replay that back and say oh have you got a sec i just want to replay what you did that you can make some improvements and obviously you can't do that in real life um, and for us to replay it and walk around and watch you as you were performing whenever you did that task could be several years ago it's much more powerful than having a bit of signature on a paper to say you completed something when we can just replay it and go back there. So, um, it, yeah, it's really, really powerful for training and, and 
all the other things we've mentioned and as you've experienced you can see the benefit just being here um yeah. yeah and it's great like i'm putting facial expressions as you're talking so it feels really real to me it you don't sort of feel like well i'm just sort of just staring into uh you know this avatar's eyes and having this conversation it's so much more than that obviously it doesn't take away some things in real life it is really really powerful yeah 100 percent. and i can like i said i see lots of use cases for this kind of this kind of virtual world for people to engage and especially maybe in areas where people have um specific needs right so i think we, we've discussed previously around um children with special needs as an example yeah. of how you bring them into an environment where they feel safer and things like that um if you're doing uh i don't know if you're going to be working with an individual as a as a an assessor or someone that's a social worker as, a, as an example and they don't feel comfortable going to a location or they don't feel comfortable so said this is another way of bringing that that comfort factor to them in a in a gamification world ultimately making it yeah absolutely trust. And i think one of the things that's worth noting as well is that people always look at um words like gamification and turning things into a game is, is a bad thing but with the, with the new generation of people coming into any market now, and especially in the IT landscape, a lot of people have come from a technical background or from a gaming background, whatever it might be, and they're looking at the next thing to keep them interested. And this is another way of keeping people interested. It's not just another Zoom call. It's just not another pub quiz. You could go to a virtual pub, have a beverage, kind of, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and play a game and all those kind of things in a social way in, in a current issue that we have now with the current pandemic we can get on with that without having to worry about going and contracting potentially COVID-19. Yeah exactly and I think that if you've got a group of people here you can obviously you know turn on that 3D sound and, and people going to different places it might be outside in the snow you know, um, or you know by the fire outside or in here or in the sauna which is a little bit strange uh, or at the table behind us it's just like you can break off into groups it's not like we're going oh can we just get people into different virtual video rooms it is a case of just moving where you want to go, seeing people. Oh, look, it's Mr. Tech Talk. I can see it above his head and it's Kyle's face. I know who that is. And it's just so much easier to walk up and feel mobile. That's the difference. You know, even if you're not in VR, which you can do this just on a desktop view, to be able to walk around and, and sort of navigate and see and meet people and carry out different interactive tasks is super, super powerful. You talked about what we're doing uh, with VR education. And there's a number of people who've got really interested in that. And we use the phrase multimodal learning quite a lot. And my brother is an, an educational expert, um, Craig Wilkie, and uh, we're doing some amazing projects with him. And, you know, he's a technologist and a teacher and really believes this is 100% the future. And, uh, okay, in so should we take it outside and carry on the conversation? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So if, if you were giving words of wisdom to someone that was... Um, going to be starting out their career again right and i know we did three tips earlier would you say that going and learning the tools of the trade and, and getting life experiences within a low-risk environment is, is critical to starting your own business would you say or would you say just getting throwing yourself at it and just getting on with it was probably a better way mm, interesting i think like the throwing ourselves at it was in my opinion like we were doing something new it was risky we knew it wouldn't hold well in a recession unless we really thought on our feet and pivoted hopefully i feel like we've done um you've got words of wisdom would be you've got to first of all forget about like starting a business and all these things because i think people sometimes feel like that's the easy option and also a lot of people feel you know you know if people were educated better they could run their own business i'm not entirely sure about that um i think you've really got to have a willingness to learn and a willingness to put in a lot of effort and to learn a lot of things yourself um, you, know, you, need to, you can't really outsource a lot of these things. You need to be, I think, fairly FA with design and understanding the commerciality and the viability of how to run a business and from, you know, from a tax, from a bit of compliance, from how you're going to finance it. You really got to have that worked out. But I think fundamentally, you've got to know what you want to do. You've got to know what you really, really enjoy. And that might mean for some people something completely different to what they're doing now. There's a lot of people that are unhappy and they just kind of deal with it because it pays the bills which is pretty sad there's some people that are have been in a job for a while they know it's been fun but not now and actually they really want to be tested and um for them i think it's really important to say okay it, it's just slightly re-angling yourself to something that's 
in that field perhaps but it's just something that you're just super super passionate about and no day will really feel like work um so yeah i do feel that you've got to be switched on you've really got to do your research you've got to be prepared to put in a lot of effort in but it's really like it's all about the customer what's the demand what's out there is this a viable product what am i going to need to do in the future to adapt and then really understanding what's what what's a customer willing to pay and therefore what margin can you make and what's the volume of that sailing sale opportunity so it might be great if it's high ticket if it's low volume you need to just consider that as you're sort of building out your business plan um but i think the easiest thing to do which someone said who i'm very close to you know, if you want to do something that's really successful, look at what someone else is doing. It's already existing, very successful in, in a market and deliver it better than them. Um, we're not quite doing that in that there's not many people doing what we're doing, but we do feel of the people that we compete with loosely, um, we definitely go above and beyond compared to what they do. So, um, yeah, definitely be prepared to graft. You've got to work it out yourself. And uh, that's going to really help you understand the business rather than just outsourcing it and throwing a lot of money into salaries. So, you know, every business is different, but loosely, that would be my uh, view and opinion. Yeah, perfect. And on a day-to-day -day basis, right, we'll be using technology to, to, to run these businesses that you run, right? So is yeah. there any unsung hero of technology that you use daily that people need to be aware of? We use a lot of the Google products. Um, sorry for all those people using Microsoft out there. Um, but we love its simplicity, its um, innovation around how easy it is to access and, uh, you know, how we can collaborate live and use the features that I know a lot of people out there just don't use, which is a real shame. Um, pretty more of a conversation on that another time. Um, but we use that and obviously a lot of, you know, design products like Canva, collaboration products, obviously, like we're using now, and various other tools. So yeah, the ability for us to use the tools that we sell to customers is, I think, really powerful. I think a lot of businesses can learn from that in aiding their teams to get technically skilled up and their salespeople to actually love and live in the product. Um, I think a lot of people get that wrong. But yeah, for us, being, being you know, anywhere and being able to access it, whether it's our phone or our desktop, you know, it's, it's old hat really now. Everyone should be doing that, but a lot of people aren't. We do, and we think we use that to great success, a great level of efficiency. And uh, being able to communicate communicate freely through those tools has been really powerful for at least setting up this business and even the day to day running of it now. In, in the time that you were in the channel, right, and you would have you would have seen how various organisations function through negotiation and all those other things. But do you think there's any areas where people just don't invest and where they should? I think. Like one of the biggest areas is in the tech industry, the lack of tech being used. Um, it's slightly ironic, but and you look across the channel and you realise, you know, the channel. If it, you know, if it's trying to sell RPA software, it should be using it. Um, if it's trying to understand how to resell analytics tools like AI, then it should be using it in its business and giving people the data to make decisions. Um, so I think businesses could learn a lot from actually giving the people in that business an understanding of what is being sold in the latest technology. Um, obviously, in my experience, this technology is moving so fast, there's so many different things to learn, but I definitely think giving the end users, the people that are the evangelists, the people that are the influencers, access and understanding to even something that might not sound exciting, exciting and sexy like a security product, if people understood it better, I think they'd find something interesting and sexy to be talking about it. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's really important. A lot of people get that wrong. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Of course, we take it back up to the balcony and I'll carry on conversation there. Yep. What, what technology is taking your interest in? I know obviously there's VR that we're using today, which is extremely cool, right? Is there anything else in the industry that's taking your interest from a technology point of view? Um, yeah, for me, probably RPA software. Um, Again, I think it's something a lot of businesses really don't understand. There's tools out there now that can be rapidly deployed. And I think when I look at that and you get the typical response, you know, it's going to take jobs and all the rest of it. For me, there's, there's a lot of admin. I know that there's people that love administration, which is great. And there's a lot of people in administration that actually don't love it and would love to be trained and upskilled to do something that's perhaps more valuable. And RPA, 
especially some of the products that I'm, I work with right now, um, the, the rapid deployment and how the user can self, essentially self-record and deploy RPA with very to little, little to none in the programming sense is hugely, hugely important. There's far too many businesses out there that are copying and pasting between applications, and this can just be set up and running in minutes, I think is a fair, is, is definitely a single digit minutes is an absolute fair um, answer to that. So for me, RPA is really powerful. So many businesses don't get it, are not willing to invest in it. I think it's expensive and slow. And I think a lot of people do make it expensive and slow. And um, there's some really good products out there that are rapid. Um, again, like, you know, data analytics, something like Power BI or similar. Um, for me, it's a game changer. Too many businesses, you know, 12, 12 Excel spreadsheets across the business with 150 different answers in terms of, you know, business profitability and um, analytics in terms of KPIs to help drive decisions. You know, very slow, only accessible from a PC. It's dated. And uh, I, I think that means that, you know, this leaders and decision makers in the business just aren't getting the right information to make decisions. I think a lot of that is there are probably a lot of leaders in the industry that aren't really leaders and have got there through various different ways. Um, but I definitely think the leaders that care, and that want change, they, you know, they've got the ability to access good data and businesses, especially in the channel, need to be willing to invest in the tools that are going to allow them and enable them to have accurate, meaningful data to make those valuable decisions. Yeah, and I think making decisions without data is, is gambling, right? You, you, you're betting on people's livelihoods, ultimately, for an yeah. outcome that you, you can't not necessarily um, put all your money on, right, and put go all in, but at least have a bit more of a chance if you've got the data that shows there's a good chance it's going to pay you a return. Yeah, so, absolutely. Cool, perfect. So I think what we'll do now then is we'll go into the lightning round, right? So quick questions, quick answers, or we'll cover off um, everything about you as an individual, right? So lightning round, favourite song? Spooky Nights. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, favourite book? Uh, the Bible. What means the most to you? Uh, my faith. Ooh. And ooh, what else is there? Last technology purchase. Oculus Quest 2. Yeah, cool, good answer. And <laughs> oh, I can't remember the other one on there. Okay. What does work-life balance mean to you? For me, the ability, I, I think I, I love work. I, I guess I love problem solving. I love helping customers. Um, yeah, so work-life balance. I think for me, you, you've got to be prepared to work really hard. I, I do love working hard. I also love the ability to know I can have flexibility. So going out for an hour, working on the car, coming in, not traveling like I used to, that's really powerful for me. Um, you know, spending more time with the family, more time with the kids is is super important. And uh, I still work incredibly hard, work really long hours. Then I'm getting up later. You know, I'm taking the kids into school. I'm spending time with them. And uh, yeah, for me, that's it's really powerful to have the option to be able to do that. And um, what did you want to do when you finished school? I wanted to be a police officer. Um, and then I think I got put off when someone told me how much paperwork there was. And it wasn't all about chasing people around in fast cars, which is obviously a passion of mine. So, um, yeah, I went off that idea. I think my family were in IT. There was a lot of talk of, you know, I don't want to sound, sound I'm old, but like a lot of talk about IT technology in the future when I was growing up. And uh, probably there was a bit of money there. I probably understood that. And so that was the reason why I went that route. Yeah, awesome. Okay. What would your word of wisdom be if it was in a tweet? Can you look back in 10 years' time and be happy about what you've achieved and what you've tried? Have you truly tested yourself? So I think on that note, we could probably call it a day. Um, again, yep. thank you very much for the time, this experience, and shipping me out a VR headset to use for this. It's a fantastic experience to do, and I really, I really advocate people to go and give this a go, especially from a, a social interaction. For anyone that's managing a team out there, I, I, I just started taking over a team in January, and I think, Doing a social engagement like this with your team would be definitely powerful if you, if you can look at putting the time into it and maybe some investment from your employer. Yeah, amazing. Should we end with a high five? Yeah, let's give it a go.